ultimus Romanorum Fulcasius. Con eminem forciorem urs unquam dignere poterit. Quem tassi clamum mondum curate, ne funeribus magnis, animi militum que ciderit. Casi milites te brute clam accusant, se cladem pudere itaque, Ius atua efficere minime cupiunt, que cum hostes, victores, oderint. Rupsus pugnare cupiunt. Nos risoc dicide. Clarissima victoria oge pugnatum esse, quae paene plena fuiset. Nisi nostri, cum hostes profligare poset. Utaguiani castra festinante ar diripere maluiset. Quitamen hostes, sumis in angustiis, Aut diu resistere poterunt. Quo igitur patientius perseverabimus, e o maior eri vittoria. Bruto ha ragione a raccomandare la pazienza ai suoi uomini. Se procedesse come forse vorre, come vorrebbe allogorare l'esercito avversario, contando anche sull'appoggio della flotta che ha, eh, potrebbe, ancora, potrebbe, ancora vincere, potrebbe ancora vincere la battaglia, potrebbe ancora vincere la guerra oltre che la battaglia. To worsen the situation, every day Antony's legions took up position at sword's length to defy Brutus' troops with insults and provocations. Brutus felt alone, alone and deprived of Cassius. And yet, confident of his position, he delayed the final battle, which the Caesarians continuously provoked. Brutus a bien analysé la situation. Il voit bien que le camp césarien est en proie d'une part à la disette, d'autre part à, aux rigueurs euh, d'un automne exceptionnellement rigoureux. Euh, et tout cela fait qu'il euh, sait qu'il commence à les avoir à sa merci. On Antony and Octavian's camp, the situation had turned critical. Famine claimed victim after victim. Morale was at a low. Stomachs knotted. The troops had had enough of tramping through mud, and in the morning, they frequently had to break off the thin layer of ice that had formed on their fingers during the freezing night. Since losing access to the sea, supplies were few and far between. In Brutus's camp, resources were inexhaustible. But although the situation appeared comfortable, his soldiers, desperate for revenge, were gradually drained by the constant waiting. To pacify them, Brutus fed them well, paid them double, and even offered armor in solid silver to his officers. L'autorità di Bruto nel campo sembra essere veramente, veramente al limite, al limite minimo, cioè Bruto non riesce a controllare le sue truppe. Il 23 ottobre accetta la battaglia, accetta la battaglia decisiva. Il malcontento all'interno del campo fra le truppe potrebbe produrre un, uh, un aumento, una crescita delle, delle diserzioni. L'esercito dei triunviri è, è in condizioni peggiori del suo da certi punti di vista. Nella realtà ha paura che venga scambiata per, per, per viltà la sua decisione di non combattere e alla fine eh, segue la volontà dell'esercito e accetta la, la battaglia campale. Sicut Pompeius Magnus, non imperator, sed imperatus bellum disturus esse vide ora. 
Konya mita est. In proilium rodeamus. Signum Apollonisto. Codutinamus tegat. At pugna muenit. Vive Marcus Antonius! Vive Marcus Antonius! Vive Marcus Antonius! Stop this guy! Let's go! For three weeks, the Caesarian legions stood in formation. For three weeks, the Republicans refused battle. But finally, they decided to accept. The eagle from Antony's camp was the victor. Antony urged his troops into battle in customary fashion. According to the historian Appian, he said, Soldiers of Rome, the enemy is before us. Those whom we have tried to draw out from behind their fortifications. Let none of you prefer untreatable and murderous hunger to enemy ramparts and bodies attainable through courage, the sword, and despair. Our situation is so bad that nothing can be postponed until tomorrow. It is today that will be decided either complete victory or death with honor. Thus, Philippi became a battlefield of ideas. On one side, Brutus and Cassius fighting for freedom and the Republic. And on the other, Antony and Octavian to uphold the work of Caesar and the might of Rome. A struggle between republicanism and monarchism. One of Brutus's top officers from Gaul surrendered to the enemy, forcing him to accept battle. Mos copiristis, at pugna me coegistis, cum manio more vincere possim. Quae spes, et mea, et vuestra, vobis non decienda est. Cum superiora, lobis no casunt, tuta coeterga, tu minini quo loco ostis, qui inter nos, Let famine intercede! Adios! 
With the experience of many military campaigns behind him, Antony had a plan. Firstly, he would stretch out his right wing, forcing his adversary to do the same, and thus weakening the center of his battle formation. Secondly, Antony would take advantage of the gap to send his cavalry in to attack Brutus's center. Finally, all that would remain to be done was to surround Brutus's infantry with a pincer movement that would prove fatal to the enemy. made reasonable headway into the Caesarian ranks, but his weakened center would not hold out much longer. It was time to remind his legionaries of the righteousness of their cause, the defense of the Republic. Aut Vittoria mea, Romanis libertatem red dead, aut mors, mi servitute liberavit, quetera tuta securaque sunt nisi hoc, utrum nos in libertate vituri, an morituri simus. As the plain reddened with spilled blood, the hope of victory increased tenfold the strength and fervor of the Caesarian troops. The close combat was of an extreme violence, each man fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe with the same weapons. Appian tells us, one side fought for survival rather than victory, the other for victory, and to please a general who had forced them to fight against his will. The carnage and the howls of the dying were atrocious. Antony dispersed the Republicans, preventing them from regrouping. Brutus's troops capitulated under Antony's pressure. Miserere nobis, Caesar! Oenam petimus! Non ne Romani sumus? Fili juventu tam inspike! Corre egos tibus supplicibus concere edebeam. Aliquit tamen opportunum efficere possum. Tortibus consulemus Uter in Tegersi. <laughs> Diripite, milites! Ut promisum e! Quam praeda meriti estis. At the end of the second battle, Brutus just managed to flee into the hills, the result of being unable to impose himself on his legionaries. Antony's brilliant military strategy had brought about success. By striking at Cassius, he unmasked the weaknesses of Brutus, deprived of his precious allies' counsel. Thirty thousand men died in this civil war, the bloodiest in all antiquity. 
armed with the same weapons, speaking the same language, they fought against countrymen, friends, and even brothers. In despair, Brutus took his own life, preferring death as a free man to the ignobility of capture. According to Plutarch, his dying words were, O wretched virtue, thou wert but a name, and yet I worshipped thee as real indeed, but now it seems thou wert but fortune's slave. With Brutus, the last flames of the senator's republic died out. His body was carried before the true architect of the victory. Antony and Octavian had too many other concerns to allow themselves to bask in glory. Caesar was finally avenged and their own power consolidated. The destiny of Rome had swept aside the senator's republic, weary after five centuries of existence but peace had finally been restored. The people of Rome applauded this peace they had longed for. Crowned with glory, Octavian and Antony reaffirmed their power and divided the influential zones of the empire between them. The more unassuming Octavian took the west, while Antony, the true architect of victory, the east the richest part of the empire, the capital of which was Alexandria. Cleopatra had no doubt that she would be taken to task by Antony over her absence from Philippi. Once again, she would worry about her son and her kingdom. Antony was well aware that Alexandria meant control over trade in the east and a crucial strategic base for any plans for expansion. Dominion over Egypt was a major concern for the Romans. Antony and Octavian had become the masters of the Mediterranean. The Roman Empire now had two heads. Would peace remain one of their ambitions?